Today's class, called it the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And let's go straight to the class. The rhyme of the ancient mariner by Coleridge in seven parts. So before we go to the class proper, let's have an introduction to the rhyme of the ancient mariner. So this is the original spelling, the rhyme R-I-M-E of the ancient A-N-C-Y-E-N-T, mariner M-A-R-I-N-E-R-E. -E -E. So it was published for the first time in Lyrical Ballads, first edition, 1798. And this is the opening poem of that edition, 1798 edition. And second edition, 1800 Lyrical Ballads. The poem was moved to the thir 23rd position, one before the last one, right? So you know how many poems are there or were there in the first edition, 1798. So first, 1798, first position. And in the second edition, it was moved to the 23rd position. So it was asked in a net exam. In the second edition, what is the position of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, 23rd? Yes, there are totally 23 poems or 24 poems. Okay. Next one. Uh, then 1802, that is the third edition. Then 1805 the fourth edition. So uh, these are the editions, primary editions, but there are also other editions. Then second edition, Calder changed the title to The Ancient Mariner, A Poet's Reverie. So he, he added what kind of a subtitle, A Poet's Reverie, a kind of a dream. Then he came up with his own versions uh, published for Sibylline Leaves, 1817 which had 625 lines. And this is the version we are going to look at today. And for this version, Coleridge also added marginal gloss, kind of a glossary, kind of comments, wherever possible, right? Then the last version by Coleridge, 1834. And today we are going to look at this 625 line poem. Where possible, wherever possible, I will explain the lines word for word. Otherwise, we will just read through the line. The aim of this class is to take you through this classic poem. Okay. And what I have done, I have also included some pictures for you and also some uh, the marginal notes provided by Coleridge. Okay. So with this, let's go to the proper poem. Oh, one more thing. The divisions, there are seven divisions. It's in dialect form. Then it's also in the ballad form, ballad kind of a narrative poem. And Coleridge is known for introducing supernaturalism and superstition into poetry and also Gothic imagery. And as we say, ballad, ballad, a narrative poem of kind of a folk song. So we have something called ballad stanza. When you say ballad stanza, generally a quatrain, a four line stanza. We have two primary rhyme scheme, A, B, C, B, or A, B, A, B. These are the primary rhyme scheme used in quatrains in ballad stanza. The first line and the third line, we have this meter, iambic tetrameter. So when we say iambic tetrameter, how many syllables are there? Then the second and fourth lines, we have iambic trimeter. So the most predominant meter in English is iambic pentameter. When we say iambic pentameter, we have, you know, uh, 10 syllables. So when we say iambic tetrameter, we have eight syllables. Then iambic trimeter, six syllables. But it's a mixed one. But uh, Coleridge doesn't strictly follow all these things. Where, you know, somewhere he goes against all these things. Okay. Let's start with the poem. It starts with an epigraph. The epigraph is in Latin. It's quoted from a translated work by T. Burnett, Archaeology of Philosophy, page number 68. So let's read the translation itself. So this is the translation. T. Burnett, Archaeology Philosophica. Right, that is the short version. So let's read the first line of this epigraph. I readily believe that there are more invisible natures in the universe than visible ones. So when you get time, also read through the entire epigraph if you want. 
and it starts with an argument. Argument is the essence of or the gist of the entire poem. How a ship having passed the line, the line here refers to equator or equatorial line, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the south pole. So that is the first section of the poem. And how from thence, I mean south pole, she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean and of the strange things that befell and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. So it is the journey of the ancient mariner to the South Pole and the strange things he witnessed there and his return to England. So let's go for part one. So there are seven parts. We'll start with part one. It is an ancient mariner, the opening line, and he stopped one of the three. So one of the three refers to wedding guests. So there were or there are three wedding guests. They are going to attend a wedding and the ancient mariner stops one of them. By the long gray beard and glittering eye, now, wherefore stop thou me? And that guest asked this question, hey, why are you stopping me? And you should also notice this, you know, uh, description, glittering eye. Because the wedding guest looks at his eyes, you know, gets mesmerized. There is something in the eye of the ancient mariner. And it is stressed again and again throughout the poem. Glittering eye or kind of a bright eye. The bridegroom's doors are wi opened wide and I am next of kin. So he says, the wedding guest says, see, I am next of kin. I am a close relative of the bridegroom. I have to attend the feast. I am here, leave me alone. The guests are met, the feast is set, may hear the merry din. So can't you hear, you know, the dance, the party and all the noise coming from there. I have to go there, leave me alone. See what I have done? See, this is a gloss, G-L-O-S-S, notes provided by Coleridge. Because when it was published for the first time, Coleridge was accused of or charged of uh, giving a poem which people could not understand. So, in his own edition, he gave some gloss so that anyone can understand. So, this is Coleridge notes. An ancient mariner meted three gallons, bidden to a wedding feast and detained to one. Short. And what I have done here, there is um, a lot of paintings. There are a lot of paintings by the French artist Gustave Doré. So, this is a painting by or kind of an engraving by Gustav Dore. So I have included his pictures. See, this is the opening scene. There are three wedding guests. The ancient mariner detains one and he is going to tell his story to this particular wedding guest. He holds him with his skinny hand. So now he starts his story. There was a ship, quoted he. But the other guy says, hold off, unhand me. Grey beard loon. Loon means is a lunatic. F soon his hand dropped he. So of course he takes his hands off. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still. As I told you before, his eyes, the eyes of the ancient mariner has some power. And it mesmerizes the wedding guest. The wedding guest, you know, he has been protesting. Now he stops and listens. Like a three-year child, the mariner had his will. Now he got his attention and he's going to tell the story. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. See, he doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to listen to the story. But something happened. Something is in the eye of the ancient mariner. And that is against trust. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse uh, top. So this is how he starts the story. So he starts with the voyage of the ship from England. So it was cheered by people and look at the description. First is goes past the kirk, K-I-R-K, sorry. Kirk means church. Then it goes past the hill, then the lighthouse. Remember the order. 
first the church, then the hill and the lighthouse. Because when he comes back, Caldrich very beautifully reverses the order. Okay. The sun came upon the lift. Out of the sea came he. And he shone bright on the, on the right. We went down into the sea. So this shows the direction of the journey. They are going towards the south. And this we get to know because the sun rises from the left side of the ship. Higher and higher every day till over the mast at noon. The wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bazoon. So the story is progressing, but the wedding guest suddenly, you know, shakes off his, you know, the mesmerization. He says, no, the wedding has started. I have to go because there is a party. There is music coming from there. And this is the notes by Coldridge. The mariner tells the ship, tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather and it reached the line. The line refers to the equatorial line. The bride had faced, had paced into the hall, red as a rose is she. So it's a simile and it's a description of the bride who is beautiful and rose is a typical symbol for that. Nodding their heads before her goes the merry minsterly. So minsterly is the music band or the minstrels, those who are the wandering musicians. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on the ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. Again, it is stressed, the mariner has bright eyes. It, you know, they cast a spell on the listener, especially this particular wedding guest. So this is the notes. The wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the ancient mariner continueth his tale. And now the storm blast came and he was tyrannous and strong. So here is a personification. Now the ship has gone past England and it has gone past um, equatorial line. And it is caught in a storm. And the storm is personified as a tyrant. And the storm is chasing this uh, ship. He struck with his overtaking wings and chased us south along with the sloping mass and dipping bro the bro p r o w pro is the front part of a ship as who pursued with ill and blow still treads the shadow of his foe so as if one is chasing the other so we have the ship going in front and the storm is chasing from behind so the shadow of his foe foe here refers to the storm and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud, rode the blast, and southward a flood. So they are forced to move towards the south, I mean towards South Pole. So this is the notes. The ship drawn by a storm towards the South Pole. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald. So another simile. So the description is about the ice. So almost like you can imagine Titanic, the ship. So the high, uh, it is mast high. So the, the ship can't move. They do not have a clear vision. And it is as green as emerald. And through the drifts, the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen and it is shining. Sheen is kind of a shining. Nor shapes of men, nor beasts, we can. We, I mean, can here refers to see. We can't see anything in front of us, even those who you know nearby me, men or beasts. The ice was all between. So the ice is so thick, they can't see each other. The mariners can't see each other, see each other or they can't see anyone or anything in front of them. This is notes. The land of ice and of fearful sounds where no living thing was to be seen. The ice was here, the ice was there. The ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swamp. 
so it's a beautiful um, line it cracked and growled and roared and howled so anyone what is the figure of speech employed in this line there are a lot of i mean i would say at least two uh, number one it appeals to your ears it cracked and growled and roared and howled so onomatopoeia is good so onomatopoeia is words resembling the noise or the sound onomatopoeia and uh, one more for effect coldridge has added a lot of conjunctions and 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 it cracked and growled and roared and howled so if you use a lot of conjunctions there is also a figure of speech for this what is that figure of speech it starts with poly poly means many poly sounded on good so like noises in a swound swound is kind of a fainting so if you faint you make noise and you faint so like that there are a lot of eyes at length did cross and albatross so now the introduction of the bird an albatross through the fog it came as if it had been a christian soul we hailed it in god's name so the arrival of the albatross is seen as a blessing a good omen a christian soul because now they are caught in the ice so this is notes till a great sea bird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality it ate the food it never had eat here eat is the past participle eaten and round and round it flew the ice did split with a thunder fit the helmsman steered us through so it's a good omen the arrival of the albatross you know helps you know maybe it, it causes a spell on the ice the ice breaks and the helmsman he starts the ship and a good south wind sprung up behind the albatross did follow and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow so it's a it considered a friend the albatross follows them and it plays with the mariners they offer uh, the albatross food and they have a bond a familiar bond and lo the albatross this is notes the albatross provided a bird of good omen and followed the ship as it returned northward through fog and floating ice so the ship now moves away from south pole and towards north in mist or cloud or mast or shroud it perched for vespers nine so for nine evenings or for nine days it has been following the ship vesper here refers to northern lights so when you look at the northern sky there it is a kind of a kaleidoscopic image you know full of lights so vesper is actually an evening uh, evening bell for prayer from the church it's a church bell for prayer now in extension we can say vesper refers to evening and when you say nine evenings it refers to nine days so it perched for vespers nine whilst all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moon shine so so far everything is going good but something happened god save the ancient mariner from the fiends that plague thee thus why looks thou so so he is acting strangely so very short description with my cross bow i shot the albatross no reason at all something came over this ancient mariner so he took his cross bow what you see on the screen is a cross bow so he shot the albatross so that's that's the end of part 1 so the ancient mariner inhospitably killed the pious bird of good omen so that is part 1 now we go to the part 2 so again the description of the sun throughout the poem you have the description of the sun because sun is a very important symbol in this poem because it's going to torture them the sun now rose up rose upon the right the right side of the ship so now they are moving towards the north we know the direction because of this out of the sea came he still hid in mist and on the left went down into the sea so this is the rising and this is the sunset 
and the good south wind still blew behind and no sweet bird did follow nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow so this is the repetition earlier the friendly bird played with them and asked for food and they provided it with food now it's gone and i i had done a hellish thing now he realizes that he has done something bad and it would work them ooh. so it's going to be a bad omen and it's going to bring them you know all the bad things for all a bird i had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow so it was that bird because of that bird earlier they were caught in the ice because of that arrival because of its arrival you know they got that breeze and they moved towards north a wretch said they the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow so they refer to the mariners the fellow mariners started shouting at the ancient mariner you have no sense at all that's a good bird a bird of omen you kill that bird because of you we are going to suffer a lot nor dim or red like god's own head the glorious sun upraised so again the description of the sun so something is do something has to do with the sun it you know it's going to um, act strangely later so coleridge is stressing the sun the glorious sun upraised like god's own head kind of a halo then all a bird i had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist is fine but look at you know look at the reaction from the mariners it was right said they such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist see earlier they said you are the one they cursed the ancient mariner now they realize you know such birds should be killed because they bring uh, also fog and mist and because of this you know there is a change in the entire scenario earlier they were blessed the mariners now since they support the murder the murder of the albatross by the ancient mariner somehow the sin of the ancient mariner rubs off on to or on the other the fellow uh, mariners now they are also cursed earlier they didn't participate uh with the act now they become conspirators fellow conspirators because they support the the murder it was right such birds to slay so because of this they are also cursed now so we have description here the fair breeze continues the ship enters the pacific ocean and sails northward even till it reaches the line equatorial line so everything is good so far the fair breeze blew the white foam flew the furrow followed free the furrow here refers to you know if you look at the ship it goes it, it what do we what do we say it sails through so behind the ship you see a trail of water disturbed water right foam so that is called a furrow here furrow followed free we were the first that ever burst into the silent sea they are very happy they entered the pacific ocean but something is bad down dropped the breeze the sails dropped down it was sad as sad could be and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea suddenly everything is silent kind of a sepulchral silence nothing is there no breeze not a single one so everything is everything looks sad all in a hot and copper sky now the sun is described in a different way the bloody sun the bloody sun and also look at the word copper sky when we say copper you know it produces heat enormous heat and the sun is bloody at noon right up above the mast it did stand no bigger than the moon so it is exactly over them day after day day after day we struck nor breathe nor motion as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean this is a beautiful description you know look at the picture i mean it is itself a picture a beautiful simile a comparison they think they are the painted sailors or the painted ship or the painted ocean 
So like a ship in a painting, they are not moving at all, very still. So that's why he gives this beautiful simile. And comes the most uh, often quoted line, uh, lines from this point. Water, water everywhere and all the boats did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot. And what is this very deep? Uh, what is this? What is rotting exactly here? There is an explanation that sea weeds. There are a lot of sea weeds. The sea weeds are rotting from inside the uh, ocean. So the rotting of that seaweed, you know, emanates bad smell. So look at the scene. They are stuck. There is no breeze. Uh, the ship is standing still. They have to survive and the sun is beating down on them. And around them, everything is rotting. The seaweeds or maybe the dead animals or dead fish. So there is also smell, bad smell. Oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yeah, slimy things did crawl with the legs upon the slimy sea. So something is you know, sticky, dead, it's slimy, it smells bad. A kind of you know oily thing is there, maybe dead fish or kind of um, seaweed, you know, floating and rotting. So this is the description. And the albatross begins to be avenged. So here starts the revenge or kind of an vengeance. About, about in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burned green and blue and white. So here is another description. As I told you before, there is something called northern lights. The death fires refers to the northern lights. So the horizon or on the horizon, they see the northern lights. It is dancing at night. And, you know, Caldridge has to bring in that supernatural element. So there is a comparison. The water, like a witch's oils. In those days, you know, the witches or the those who practiced witchcraft, they used a kind of a special oil, you know, to create illusion. So they used a colorful, you know, uh, smoke, uh, smoke screen. So it burnt green and blue and white. This is the description of the Northern Lights, but it's also comparison of witch. So witchcraft, a kind of someone is casting a bad spell on the uh, mariners. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued, uh, plagued us so. So they believe there is a spirit, I mean, from the uh, South Pole following them. Nine fathom deep, he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. So there is a spirit which is very fond of the albatross. Now the spirit is very angry because the albatross is dead. So the spirit wants to take revenge on the sailors, especially the ancient mariner. So this spirit from the South Pole has been following the ship. And it has been following underneath, you know, nine fathom deep. He had followed us from the land of mist and snow. This is the description. A spirit had followed them, one of the invisible inhabitants of this planet. And every tongue <clears throat> through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, oh, bill a day, what evil looks had I from old and young? Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. Now the sailors are against the albatross mariner, and albatross, I mean, uh, the killer of the albatross, the ancient mariner. Now they are very unhappy. So they want to punish this guy. So symbolically, you know, look at the two symbols. So you, they generally wear the cross for production. So instead of the cross, the holy cross, now they use the albatross, the dead albatross uh, as a kind of a punishment. So it was hung around the sailor's neck. So that is part two. Now let's go for part three. There passed a very time. Each throat was parched 
and glazed each eye. So look at the description. They are very thirsty. You know, parched. There is no water. And look at their eye. It is glazed. I mean, glazed. The eyes are tired that you can't see what is in front of you. A very time. So very, it's tired. A very time. Again, it's kind for stress. How glazed each very eye. When looking westward, I beheld something in the sky. So suddenly, the ancient mariner is saying he saw something in the sky. At first, it seemed a little speck, kind of a little dust. Then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at least a certain shape, I wished. So he thinks something is coming. It could be a ship. So he summarizes a speck, a mist, a shape. I wished I see. And still it neared and neared as if it dodged a water sprit. It plunged and tacked and veered. So it seems there is something coming towards the ship as if it is being chased by a sprit. So something is coming. So this is the description. The ancient mariner beholdeth a sign in the element far, afar off. So beholdeth, you see. So the ancient mariner saw a sign. With the throats unslaked, with the black lips baked, we could not laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb they stood. So they couldn't shout because they are parched, they are very thirsty. So the ancient mariner uses his brains. So I bit my arm, I sucked the blood. So he bit his arm, sucked his blood. So kind of a drinking. He drinks his own blood so that he can shout because uh, his throat is so parched he couldn't shout. Now he bit his arm and sucked the blood. Now he gets the energy to shout and cried, a sail, a sail. So he thinks someone is coming by or maybe passing by. So there is a rescue. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, Agape, they heard me call. Gramercy, they for joy did grin. So despite all these things, they also shouted. Gramercy means grand mercy. Grand, you know, big, great. So mercy, they are thanking God. And all at once, their breath drew in as they were drinking all. See, see, I cried. She tax no more. Hither to work us wheel. Without a breeze, without a tie, she, she studies with upright keel. But something is strange. You know, there is no breeze. Their ship, their own ship is stuck in the middle of the ocean. But look at this ship. How could it can come, you know, towards them? Because there is no breeze. There is no tide. Literally, a ship cannot move. But yet, that ship studies with upright keel is coming towards them. Keel is the, you know, the bottom part of the ship. So here is the description by Coleridge. And horror follows for can it be a ship that come onward, that comes onward without wind or tide. The western wave was all aflame. The day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. When this, that strange shape drove suddenly between us and the sun. So you have to imagine. So look at this. So just imagine that on your left, you have the ancient mariner ship. Right on the western side, you have the sun, which is about to set. In between, that strange ship comes. So it is going to block the sun rays. And it is going to come in between the ship, the ancient mariner ship and the sun. right? And straight the sun was plucked with bars. Heaven's mother sent us grace. So they think maybe heaven's mother, holy mother, Virgin Mary uh, took pity on them. Maybe she is sending something good for them. But they are wrong. As if through a dungeon grate. He peered with broad and burning face. So he here refers to the sun. The sun is about to set. So the sun is sending out its rays. But the rays can't reach 
this ship the ancient mariner ship because it seems since that ship comes between the ship the ship and the sun the sun seems to be imprisoned the sun has to send its rays through that ship right so as if through a dungeon grate as if the sun is imprisoned by that ghost ship and the sun's rays they have to peer through that dungeon alas thought i and my heart beat loud how fast she nears and nears are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers now he has a doubt is it really really a ship because there is a sail um, at the top of the mast it looks like you know web it looks like a spider's web gossamer thin or those her rips through which the sun did peer as through a grate so this is the repetition of the same uh, you know comparison the sun is peering through the prison gate and is that woman all her crew is that a death and are there two is death that woman's mate so there are a lot of questions in the mind of the ancient mariner he can see something so there is a woman and seems there is someone else which looks like a death so they are doing something there her lips were red her looks were free her locks so this is the description of the companion of death so there is a death and death has a companion so this is the description her lips are red so painted like a monster then her locks were yellow as gold look at her skin was as white as leprosy so she is described as a disease so why it is a disease so they are going to die the nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold why you know she strikes such terror in their hearts because they are not going to die because this life in death is for this guy ancient mariner this is uh, more bad than death itself see at least you can die but if this is life in death and this uh, you know makes him afraid the naked hulk alongside came so now the ship comes exactly you know between uh, straight between uh, this ship and the sun and twine were casting dice the twine refers to the two death and life in death the companion they are playing games or casting dice a game of dice the game is done i have won i have won kotath she and whistles thrice so now kotath she life in death she has won the game but what is won so what is the bed and whistles thrice thrice so thrice is kind of a symbolic you do something for, for thrice three times so she has won so this is the description so this is the explanation by conrad death and life in death have dice to fall the ship's crew and she the later winner the ancient mariner so look at the painting beautiful by gustav dore so this is uh, death okay and this is life in death so they have been play, playing a game of dice so what is the bet one says okay the entire crew is for me another says only that ancient mariner is for me so life in death so that is the later she win the ancient mariner death wins the entire crew so the entire crew is going to die because it is won by or the all the other mariners are won by death but life in death wins the ancient mariner the ancient mariner is going to suffer hell that is called life in death the sun's rim dips and the stars rush out at one strike comes the dark suddenly everything is dark with a far heard whisper over the sea up shot the specter bark suddenly the ship is gone the ghost ship look at the description specter ghost bark bark here refers to the ship the specter ship is gone it came it went away we listened and looked sideways up fear at my heart 
as at a cup my life blood seemed to sip the stars were dim and thick the night the steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white so this is the description the steersman one who is controlling the ship the wheel of the ship we can look at his face of course it is night now the sun is set so in front of the uh, steersman there is a lamp so because of that lamp we can see the face of the steersman he is white you know everyone, everyone is afraid now from the sails the dew did drip till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip so there is another omen bad omen so there is this is a marine metaphor so or a kind of a belief or kind of a superstition uh, believed by the mariners if you have a crescent moon horned refers to a crescent moon if a moon is followed by a bright star then it is a bad omen now they see that omen there is a moon it is chased by a star if you see this kind of an image this kind of a phenomena then that's a bad omen so the now realize so something's bad is going to happen one after another sir one after one by the door the sorry the star dogged moon again the symbol is stressed so this is a bad omen if the moon is chased by a star then that's a bad omen so this is a short description the star dogged moon too quick for groan or sigh each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye so yes after the departure of the ghostly ship right because the crew the entire crew is won by death so everybody is dying four times 50 living men so how many sailors are there on the ship or you know the crew four times 50 so we have to do a quick calculation four times 50 living men and i heard not sigh nor groan with a heavy thump a lifeless lump they drop down one by one so they are dying one by one because they are one by death herself so now they are dying at least so we can do a quick calculation 50 4 times 50 we can say around 200 200 members or 200 sailors they die one by one when they die they look at the ancient mariner with their eyes they are cursing so this is the description by coldridge his shipmates drop down dead but life and death begins her work on the ancient mariner see all the others they die because they are won by death but ancient mariner is won by life and death so he has to live his life and he has to see hell here itself the souls did from their bodies fly they fled to bliss or u and every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow so all the souls of the sailors they are passing by the ancient mariner every time a soul passes by so it's like like the whiz of my crossbow kind of an onomatopoeic effect and a simile so like the whiz of my crossbow why because of him you know because of his crossbow he, with this crossbow he killed the bird so it reminds him of his uh, crime see he ki- you killed the you know the albatross because of you we are suffering so every time a soul passes by he feels that pain so that is the end of part 3 let's go for part 4 see now we come back to real life i fear the ancient mariner i fear thy skinny hand and thou art long and lank and brown and is the dripped sea sand now this wedding guest is afraid the wedding guest uh, you know he thinks he is uh, you know listening to a tale maybe a weird tale now he is very afraid because he doubts whether this ancient mariner is a real person or a ghost because everybody is dead or everybody was dead on that ship 
I fear thee and thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown. Then the ancient mariner see, says, Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest. This body dropped not down. I didn't die. So don't be afraid. I'm not a ghost. Alone, alone, all, all alone. Alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. See, everybody died except me. The many men so beautiful. And they all did, did lie. And a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on and so did I. So he curses himself. See, there is a comparison. Around the ship or, or around the ancient mariner, there are a lot of slimy things. You know, uh, it could be fish, it could be something else, but some creatures in the ship, in the sea. So he says, these creatures, they live, but look at my sailors. My fellow companions, they are dead. They are no more. So like these slimy things, I am also alive. So he says, I am reduced to these creatures. So I am no more humanly. So I am reduced to these uh, creatures which are supposed to be dead. But they are living, but my companions are dead. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting dick. And there the dead men lay. So here is a comparison. Around him, the sea weeds and the dead animals or dead fish, everything is rotting. And on the ship, the mariners are rotting. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prey had guessed. But he couldn't pray. A wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as a dust. So that is a kind of a whisper, maybe kind of a reminder that you are a criminal. You killed an innocent bird. And this is the description by Coleridge. He despises the creatures of the calm and envieth that they should live and so many die, so many lie dead. I closed my lids, eyelids and kept them close and the balls like pulses beat. So one more thing, the ancient mariner feels that he couldn't sleep. So heavy eyes, because of lack of sleep, the eye, eyelids, you know, they are very heavy. And the eyeballs of the ancient mariner, the kind of a beating, like pulses beat. For the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay dead like a load on my very eye. So he can feel that, you know, uh, lack of sleep, like a load, it, it's on the eyes. And the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, rot, sorry, nor rot, nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. So look at the situation. Now he is on the ship. Everybody is dead around him. And everybody is staring at him. At least he imagines that they are looking at him. And the look says, all the looks says, you are a criminal. You did something bad. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a sprit from on high. But oh, more horrible than that. So this is another belief. He says, if an orphan boy or an orphan girl curses you, because you, if you do something bad to them or if you don't help them, if they curse you, definitely you will fall from your height. Right? But oh, this is more horrible than that. Is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse and yet I could not die. So now we know that for a week, he is stuck there. So he has to be in the sea, on the boat, looking at everything rotting around him and also on the ship. Description, but the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead man. The moving moon bent up the sky and no bad did abide. Softly she was going up and a star or two beside. Again, the omen is stressed. See, this is the third time the description uh, comes. Uh, the moving moon. So there is a moon. It is chased by a star or two. So for, according to our the belief, 
this is the belief of the ancient i mean the mariners if a sh the moon especially the crescent moon is followed by a star it's a bad omen so we know still he is cursed her beams bemocked the sultry main like april hoar frost spread so h o e r hoar means white frost spread so like april so maybe he is thinking of his native country england so in april maybe it is everywhere there is kind of frost white frost like that now at night the beams of the moon is there everywhere but where the ships hung shadow lay the charmed water burned away a still an awful red so there is some kind of a magic maybe the white beam touches on the sea waves and they look red i mean the waves or the water looks red beyond the shadow of the ship i watched the water snakes uh, this is a turning point so pay attention they moved in tracks of shining white and when they rad the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes now he is looking at the water snakes around him so he is looking into the sea into the water he 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 is seeing uh, he is looking at water snakes they are jumping in and out of the hoary white flakes of the water within the shadow of the ship i watched their rich attire so attire means dress maybe the skin of the water snakes blue glossy green and velvet black they coiled and swam and every track was a flash of golden fire so look at the scene very beautiful scene the water the choppy waters or maybe it's a kind of a slow water uh, looks red and uh, we have water snake they are jumping in and out of the water and look at them the skin of it's blue green and velvet black and also golden oh happy living things no tongue their beauty might declare a spring of love gushed from my heart and blessed them unaware sure my kind saint took pity on me and i blessed them unaware so this is the turning point see earlier he committed a crime so without thinking or maybe deliberately yes, yes deliberately he killed the albatross so what is the thing he didn't like fellow creatures a small life so now unwittingly without his awareness from his heart there is something gushing out of his heart that's love love for small lives even any creature so he says oh happy living things so he blesses the water snakes because of the because of this act this act of blessing the water snakes the curse is going to be lifted so this is the description he blessed them in his heart the spell begins to break the self same moment i could pray and there is another thing see earlier he tried to pray he couldn't pray now that very moment he was able to pray to god and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea beautiful description see so far he has been wearing that albatross around his neck and it was a punishment why punishment so look at the description like lead because the lead it's a ball of iron generally uh, you know attached to the prisoners feet so that they have to drag them behind them drag behind them so this has been a burden on the ancient mariner a, a kind of a burden of guilt now it's gone the albatross fell off on its own accord and went into the sea right so his sin kind of absolved he is free from his sin so we are go to part 5 oh sleep it is a gentle thing so we know almost for a week he didn't sleep a wink right now for the first time you know he falls asleep beloved from pole to pole to mary queen so he he prays to a uh, virgin mary and 
he is blessed by virgin mary the prize be given she sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul and he says the silly buckets what are the silly buckets on the deck why silly because they are empty they have nothing in them there is no water that had so long remained i dreamed that they were filled with dew and when i woke i it rained so he slept for some time in his dream he dreamed that these buckets are filled with water or dew so he when he woke it rained so whenever in literature if there is rain it's a kind of a blessing so now he is blessed by some heavenly god my lips were wet my throats my throat was cold my garments all were dank means cold sure i had drunken in my dreams and still my body drank i moved and i could not feel my limbs i was so light almost i thought that i had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost for the first time he feels that his guilt is gone and he feels blessed because there is rain and the albatross is gone from his neck all right and as you know from this poem we got this uh, idiom an albatross around one's neck it it means that something that you do or you have been doing for a long time but you could not finish it off right it's it, it acts like a curse for instance uh, there are a lot of people who have who have been writing net exam but it took clear maybe they can say net exam is an albatross around my neck i hope one day it will fall off by grace of the holy mother the ancient mariner is refreshed with rain so this is the description and soon i heard a roaring wind it did not come near but with its sound it shook the sails so another blessing so earlier there was no wind no breath now there is a wind that was so thin and sear the upper air burst into life and a hundred fire flags again again a hundred fire flags here again refers to the northern lights to and fro they were hurried about and to and fro and in and out the van starts danced between so everything seems happy the nature seems happy kind of you know pathetic fallacy you know the figure of speech introduced by ruskin and the coming wind did roar more loud and the sails did sigh like sedge s e d g e sedge is a tall grass so the sails of the ship they are moving and the rain poured down from one black cloud the moon was at its edge the thick black cloud was cleft and still the moon was at its side like water shot from some high crag so it's raining and he is blessed and his thirst is quenched so everything is okay the lightning fell with never a jag a river steep and wide so as if a river is coming down you know the white lightning is coming down from the clouds the loud wind never reached the ship it now the ship moved on so it's a miracle so for the ship to move we need the breeze or the wind but it's a miracle of course he can feel the wind but the wind is not nearby it the ship moves beneath the lightning and the moon the dead man gave a groan but something is happening now see look at the image there is moon there is lightning and there is also some rain and there is no wind but suddenly the dead man gave a groan they are coming back to life they groan they stirred they all uprose nor spake nor moved their eyes it had been strange even in a dream to have seen those dead men rise so they are not opening their eyes it like zombies they rise the helmsmen steered the ship moved on yet never a breeze blew up it's strange there is no breeze there is no wind and these dead men they rise and they are helping him the mariners all begin work the ropes where they were on to do so as they used to do their usual work 
they are doing their work they raise their limbs like lifeless tools we were a ghastly crew so dead men so dead men working on the ship so this is the description but not by the souls of the men but by demons of earth and middle air but by a blessed troop of angelic spirits sent down by the invocation of the guardian saint so we have to understand that uh, that these dead men are not coming back to life they are not possessed by devils they are actually possessed by a blessed troop of angelic spirits the angelic spirits sent by some guardian angel from above to help the mariner see the then the description then the ancient mariner see says the body of my son my brother's son so uh, his nephew was also dead stood by me knee to knee the body and i pulled at one rope but he said not to me so the dead body of uh, his nephew didn't speak to him but they worked together again you know this guy the wedding guest is afraid i fear the ancient mariner be calm thou wedding guest so he says hey don't be afraid i am not dead it was not those souls that fled in pain which to the corpses came again but a troop of spirits blessed so don't think you know they are possessed by devils but a troop of blessed spirits angelic spirits they are possessed by angels for when it dawned they dropped their arms and clustered around the mast so this is what happened after the sunrise you know they dropped dead again around the mast sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed around around flew each sweet sound then darted to the sun so something came out of their mouth maybe a kind of a sound and it went towards the sun slowly the sounds came back again now mixed now one by one sometimes a dropping from the sky i heard the skylark sing another good omen so when you when you can listen to the skylark maybe something good is going to happen sometimes all little birds that are how they seem to fill the sea and air bit their sweet jargony and this is a beautiful word and now as you know the word jargon j a r g o n so when we say jargon now it's a technical term right so if you use bombastic words in your field some technical sounding or high sounding words or terms that we call jargon right so for literature students if i say onomatopoeia or deisex machina uh, these are jargons but the original meaning of the word or one of the meanings of uh, this word jargon means sound wobbling uh, kind of a twittering sounds made by birds so with their sweet jargoning so he can listen to the sweet sounds of the birds and now it was like all instruments now like a lonely flute and now it is an angel song that makes the heavens be mute so everything is blessed now he can listen to all the songs it ceased yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon so it's a miracle there is no breeze nothing yet the ship moves on a noise like of a hidden brook so kind of a stream there's a kind of a noise in the leafy mouth of june sorry leafy month of june so in the month of june just imagine the scene there is a brook a kind of a stream it goes by and maybe it is carrying uh, on this on its surface you know the shed leaves in the month of june so there is a noise you can listen to that noise that too the sleeping woods all night sing at a quiet tune so this is a very beautiful simile a uh, simile so what happens in the month of june if you go to the woods forest you can listen to the brook which you can't see because it is uh, covered with the leaves the fallen leaves but there is the, some kind of music to it so that kind of music is there till noon we quietly sailed on 
Yet never a breeze did breathe slowly and smoothly when the ship moved onward from beneath. So something is pushing the ship forward because moved onward from beneath. Under the keel, nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirits slid. And it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune and ship stood still also. So now we can understand what has been pushing the ship forward, the spirit. The vengeful spirit offended by you know, the murder. Murder of uh, his companion, the spirit's companion, the albatross. The same spirit, you know, that has been that following the ship. Now, this same spirit, self same spirit, is actually pushing the ship forward. Why? So, a description: the lonesome spirit from the South Pole. So we know he committed the crime in the South Pole. So there was this spirit, a friend of Albatross. So that seeks vengeance, revenge, but the same spirit has been carrying or pushing this ship forward. Why? Because in obedience to the angelic troop, but still required vengeance. See, the spirit is not happy because it is forced to help the ancient mariner. Actually, the spirit wants to take revenge, but there is an order from above. It has to help the mariner. The sun right up above the mast had fixed her to the ocean but in a minute she began stir with a short uneasy motion backwards and forwards of her length with a short uneasy motion something is happening to the ship it is moving backward and forward and that is also the sun and then like a pawing horse let go as if uh, you know, a race horse which is about to start its race, she made a sudden bound. The ship suddenly started moving forward. It flung the blood into my head and I fell down in a swoon. Swound. S W O N O N D, kind of a fainting. So something happened, you know, the ship started moving very fast that the blood went into, I mean, a race towards his uh, head. He fainted. How long in that same spit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air. So now he is in a state of a kind of uh, stupor. So he fainted, but uh, though he is fainted, he could listen to two people talking. I mean, two spirits talking. So this is the description by Coleridge. The pole, sorry, the polar spirits, fellow demons. So who are they? The fellow demons of the polar spirit, the invisible inhabitants of the elements. So now they are speaking. Is it he quoted one, one of the spirits? So it's asking the other spirit, is this the man who killed the albatross? By him who died one cross with his cruel bow, he laid full low the harmless albatross. So now they are talking. The two spirits, the fellow demons of uh, you know, the South Pole spirit, they are talking to each other. The spirit who biddeth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bro. So this is kind of a flashback. Now the two uh, spirits are talking. So one of the spirits says, see, the spirit, the polar spirit, you know, loved the bird more. But this fellow killed that bird because of that, that spirit wants vengeance, revenge. Then the other spirit says, the other was a softer voice, as soft as honey dew. Quoted he, the man hath penance done, and penance more will he do. So it's a kind of a prophecy. The other spirit, there are two spirits talking, and the ancient mariner is now uh, 
I mean, maybe in his sleep, he has fainted because of the forward motion of the rapid speed of the ship. The one spirit you know, summar summarizes everything. The other spirit says, no, this man has done his penance. See, for his crime, he paid. He paid almost for a week, more than a week. You know, he has suffered a lot and he will suffer. Penance more will he do. So there is a prophecy. So we are going to part six. First voice, again, it's a continuation from the earlier part. But tell me, tell me, speak again. Thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? So now one of the spirits is wondering why the ship is moving so fast. And what is the ocean doing? The second voice says, Still as a slave before his Lord, the ocean had no blast. His great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. See, the ocean has no power in front of the Lord. So the Lord has sent a message to the ocean. So the motion is just listening to the master's command and it is acting on the command. If he may know which way to go, for she guides, I mean the moon is guiding, smooth and or grim. So brother see, see brother see, how graciously she looketh down on him. So it's a kind of a blessing. See the earlier the moon is chased by a, a star, a kind of a bad omen. Now it's a good omen. It, it's actually guiding the ship and also it's blessing the mariner. So this is the description. The mariner had been cast into a trance for the angelic power causes the vessel to drive northward faster than human life could, could endure. So this is the reason. First voice says, but why drives so, so drives on that ship so fast without or wave or wind? So now one of the spirits is wondering how can the ship go so fast because there is no wave or no wind. The second voice gives the explanation. The air is cut away before and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly. More high, more high, or we shall be belated. For slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. So this is the reason. In the sense, a human cannot endure or tolerate the speed of the ship. The, it is so fast, a human being cannot you know, um, uh, go with the speed. The human being can, may die because it is very fast. So in order to save the mariner from that fate, so he is now in, in, a, uh, in a trance. So once he wakes up, definitely the ship will slow down and the mariner and the speed, they, they can match with each other. So because of this reason, the mariner should not die because the, the ship is very fast and he cannot go with the speed. Then once that's gone, he wakes up. So the mariner says, I woke and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather. It was night, calm night. The moon was high. The dead men stood together. All stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter. So this is the charnel dungeon, what you see on the screen. Charnel dungeon, see those days, if a lot of people die due to plague, due to the plague, and all the dead bodies were stacked uh, underneath the city. It's called catacombs. So maybe uh, that's referred to here. All fixed on me, their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. So he's imagining. Maybe all the dead bodies, their eyes are, are looking at them, looking at him. The pang, the curse with which they died had never passed away. So still the ancient mariner can see you know, his crime in, in their eyes. I could not draw my eyes from theirs, nor turn them up to pray. So now again, you know, he couldn't pray. And now this spell was snapped. Once more, I viewed the ocean green and looked far forth. It little saw of what 
had else been seen. So again, there is the spell. Good spell is gone. Now he imagines maybe is guilty. He thinks he is no more blessed. So there is a comparison, a kind of a simile here. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on and turns no more his head. Just imagine you are walking on the street at night. It's very dark. And you know there is something following you from behind. So you just turn once and you see that monster or spirit. And what do you do? You just turn. You no more turn back. You just walk fast you know, you know, to escape that spirit. Now you are afraid. Similar way. Because he knows a frightful fiend that close behind, I mean, close behind him, dread. So he is very much aware something is following him. So if he stops or if he turns back, he is dead. That kind of a fear. But soon there breathed the wind on me. Ah, oh, he's very happy. It is not happening to him again. There is a wind. Nor sound nor motion made its path was not upon the sea. In ripple or in shade, it raised my hand. Still, he can feel the wind. You know, there is nothing around him, but still he can uh, feel the presence of the wind. It fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. So look at the comparison, the meadow. Gale, gale refers to the wind of a spring, kind of a spring, kind of a west wind. A west wind just grazing your cheek. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. So the wind is welcoming the ancient mariner back to his own country. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze. On me alone it blew. Oh, dream of joy. Is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this my own country? See, as I told you before, in the opening of this poem, when the ship went past England, I mean the England shore, the order was the Kirk, the hill, the light of storm. Now, very beautifully, it is backwards. So now the ship is entering the waters, the English waters. So the first, the light of storm, then the hill and the church. We drifted over the harbor bar. The harbor bar refers to the sand duns, the sand. And I with the sobs did pray. Oh, let me be awake, my God. Oh, let me sleep away. The harbor bay was clear as glass. So smoothly it was strewn. And on the bay, the moonlight lay and shadow of the moon. So it's a description. The rays of the moon as if it is strewn everywhere on the waves. It's very glossy. So this is a description. And the ancient mariner beholdeth his native country. So he reaches his native country, England. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less. So you can see the rock. On the top of the rock, you can see the church that stands above the rock. The moonlight steeped in silentness. The steady weathercock. You can also see the weathercock, uh, you know, uh, maybe moving in with the wind. And the bay was white with silent light, still rising from the same. Full many shapes that shadows were in crimson color, colors came. So he sees something, maybe crimson red. A little distance from the pro. Pro is a front part of the ship. Those crimson shadows were. I turned my eyes upon the dead. Oh Christ, what I, what saw I there? So something is happening now. Each corpse lay flat, the dead body, lifeless and flat, and by the holy rood, or OOD. The holy rood refers to the cross. So uh, as if, you know, uh, each of the dead bodies, uh, uh, is given a proper burial with uh, a holy root nearby or uh, stuck uh, uh, into the ground. So it seems they are also blessed. 
a man all light a seraph man kind of an angel on every corpse that stood so above each dead body there is an angel or a kind of a seraph man this seraph band so kind of an a band of angels each waved his hand it was a heavenly sight they stood as signals to the land each one a lovely light so maybe you know uh, earlier uh, you know each dead body was possessed by an angelic spirit now each angelic spirit is coming out of the dead body and each one is standing above the dead body this seraph band each waved his hand no voice did they impart no voice or but oh the silence sank like music on my heart kind of a blessing so this is a description the angelic spirits leave the dead bodies and appear in their own forms of light since they are angels you know they are they have uh, some kind of a halo around them light so now they are leaving the dead bodies but soon i heard the dash of oars so kind of a noise someone is approaching the ship from the shore i heard the pilot's cheer so one who is driving that my head was a turn per force away i saw a boat appear so we see a rescue boat coming towards the ship the pilot and with the pilot there is a boy the pilot's boy son i heard them son maybe helper i heard them coming fast dear lord in heaven it was a joy the dead men could not blast then there is also someone else on the boat i saw a third person i saw a third i heard his voice it is the hermit good so there is also a hermit a holy man he singeth loud his godly hymns then he makes in the wood that he makes in the wood he will shrive my soul he will wash away the albatross blood so he feels guilty that he has killed the albatross so like lady macbeth he feels that guilt the blood on his hands so he thinks this a hermit will wash away the albatross of blood so we are entering the last part part 7 of the ancient mariner this hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea so there is a forest near the sea so this hermit lives in that forest how loudly his sweet voice he rares he loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country so this is the reason so this hermit has been living in the woods away from human beings and he is with uh, he is into prayers and all the other things and he loves to uh, you know speak with uh, mariners coming from uh, and after the journey or after the voyages so same way he is coming now he kneels at morning and noon and evening so he prays all the time he had a cushion plump so it is the moss that holy hides the rotted old oak stump so maybe he made a cushion with the help of the moss which dried uh, along the sea shore so maybe he could have collected the moss dried moss and he might have weaved a cushion uh, which is very plump on the plump cushion he kneels down and prays to god morning evening and noon the skiff boat neared i heard them talk why it is strange i trow where are those lights so many so far that signal made but now so now this is the reason so we understand the reason why this boat is coming towards the ship so they saw a bright light so many lights you know the angels the halo of the angels that bright light so that is a signal to the people so these people so the mariner is truly blessed because he not only reached you know the country but he is also blessed there is a, there is a ship i mean there is a boat rescue boat and these people saw that light you know the angels coming out of their dead bodies that light or the lights acted as a signal so they saw that light but 
Now they are here. There is no light. Strange, by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered, not our cheer. The planks looked warped. The hermit is looking at the ship. The planks, the wooden boats of the ship looks warped. And see those sails, how thin they are, seer. I never saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were. So now the hermit is wondering, what kind of a ship is this? You know, the, pl the planks, the wood is almost gone. The sails, they are tattered. Uh, looks like a gossamer. What's happening? Brown skeletons of leaves. So there is a comparison. Now the sails of the ship, it looks like, uh, they look like brown skeletons of leaves, dry leaves. So if you look at a dry leaf, you have kind of this veins, dry veins on the skeleton of the leaf. It looks like them. I mean, the sails look like them. That lag my forest brook along. So again, the same comparison. Earlier, we also had this comparison, you know, uh, when the mariner was sleeping or maybe he was awake. So he thought he could hear a brook, you know, a brook babbling by carrying, you know, leaves, dry leaves. Same image is given by the hermit because he, is, uh, he lives in the wood. So he says, my forest brook along, you know, carries along leaves, dead leaves. Maybe the sails look like them. When the ivy tod is heavy with the snow and the owlet oops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's egg. So this is a kind of a strange description. You know, during that season, maybe winter season, ivy tod, heavy with snow, the uh, this hermit saw something strange. The young bird, I mean the owlet, comes down and eats the sheep wolf's young. You know, it's very natural in the woods, survival of the fittest, right, during the harsh season. So something happened with the same the sheep too. Maybe there is a predator or there is a prey. We don't know. Dear Lord, it had a fiendish look. The pilot made reply, I am afraid. The pilot says, no, I will not go near the ship. There is something staring at me. So that is the ancient mariner. But the hermit says, push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I not spoke, not stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship and straight a sound was heard. What, what's happening? You know, uh, this is a description. The ancient mariner is saved in the pilot's boat. So what's happening or what happened? You know, the ship started sinking. And this is the rescue boat. Under the water, it rambled on. Still louder and more dread. It reached the ship. It split the bay. The ship bent down like lead. I hope you remember this simile. Like lead. And earlier, the same description was used for the albatross. The albatross came off the neck of uh, the mariner and went into the waters of the sea like lead. So this is another description. The ship bent down like lead. The ship itself is a curse. Now it's no more a curse. So the burden is off the heart of the ancient mariner. So he there's no guilt. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that had been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swifts as dreams, myself I found within the pilot's boat. The ship is gone. The body seems floating. So he thinks he is going to drown, but he is saved by the boat. Now he finds himself in the pilot's boat. But the ship is sinking. Since it is sinking, there is a whirl, a kind of a whirlpool. And the ship, is, I mean the boat, the rescue boat is about to be caught in the whirl. But he takes control. Upon the whirl where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round and all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips. The, the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. So the pilot is afraid. I mean, uh, he looked at this ancient mariner and he fell down. 
so he fainted so someone has to take care of the boat so the ancient mariner takes care of the boat the holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit so this is the hermit the pilot the ancient mariner and the pilot's boy i took the oars the the pilot's boy who now the crazy go so now the pilot boy you know he goes mad looking at uh, the ancient mariner laughed loud and long and all the while his eyes went to and fro ha 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 quoted he full plain i see the devil knows how to row the boy is wondering this this must be a devil and the devil knows how to, how to row the boat so this is the thought process of the pilot's boy now the pilot is the pilot has fainted and the pilot boy has gone crazy and the ancient mariner takes control of the boat and now all in my own country i stood on the firm land the hermit stepped forth from the boat and scarcely he could stand so he reached the shores the hermit asked oh show me show me holy man the hermit crossed his bro say quick quoted he i bid thee say what manner of man art you so who are you so he also blesses uh, the ancient mariner so he crossed his bro forth with his frame of mind was wrenched and with a woeful agony which forced me to begin my tale and then it left me free so we know the reason why he stopped the wedding guest in the beginning so this is the reason see the sailor the ancient mariner has a curse or a kind of uh, penance he has to do some penance as said by one of the spirits right fellow demons of the spirit see sometimes the ancient mariner feels a woeful agony pain throughout the body coursing through the entire body if the pain has to subside he has to tell his tale so that is the fate that is the fate of the ancient mariner if the ancient mariner feels that pain so he has to tell the tale so that his pain will be relieved so that is the fate of the ancient mariner so this is the description the ancient mariner earnestly entreated the hermit to show him and the penance of life falls on him so now he seeks forgiveness since then at an uncertain hour that agony returns until my ghastly tale is told this heart within me burns so this is the reason you know ancient mariner stops one of the wedding guests and tells his tale so whenever he feels that pain he has to narrate his tale to someone tells the tales to someone i pass like night from land to land i have strange power of speech so he also realizes that he has some power of speech that moment that his face i see i know the man that must hear me to him my tale i teach so he is very specific the ancient mariner says i don't tell my tale to everybody see the moment i see somebody i can understand that this man should listen to my tale i don't tell my tale to everyone because he because there were three wedding guests but he stopped only one because this ancient mariner knows that this man should listen to my story so he chooses or maybe he is made to choose his listener what loud uproar burst from the door the wedding guests are there but in the garden bower the bride and the bridesmaid singing or and hark the little vesper bell as i told you before vesper is the church bell calling for uh, you know calling everyone for the evening prayer which bitted me to prayer so now he is also praying so now he addresses the wedding oh wedding guest this soul had been alone on a wide wide sea so lonely it was that god himself scars seemed there to be so i suffered a lot because i killed that albatross an innocent creature o oh, sweeter than the wedding feast it is sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company now 
I'm going to the church, I'm going to pray with these people. To walk together to the kirk, the kirk means the church, and all together pray, which each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Everybody is praying to the God. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, you wedding guest. So then this is a, since this is a ballad, kind of a moral story, so this is the moral of the entire poem. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. See, you will be blessed if you treat everyone, whether it's a human being, bird or beast, you have to treat every living creature equally. So this is the message or the moral of this poem. So again, the summarization. He prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small. And we also know why. Because the ancient mariner's curse was lifted because he blessed the fish. I mean, uh, uh, the, the creatures, all the creatures, I mean, especially the fish. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. So pray to God, believe in God and love everybody, all the creatures of God. So that is the message. The mariner whose eyes is bright. See, look at the description again. You know, the eyes is described, which is bright. Whose beard with age is hot, white, H-O-E-R means white, is gone. The mariner is gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. Now the wedding guest is no more interested in the wedding or attending the feast. He is going home. The next day, he went like one that hath been stunned. After listening to the story of the ancient mariner, the wedding guest is stunned and is of some sense forlorn. He feels lonely. But after a night, a night's sleep, a sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn. That means the next day he woke up and he feels something fresh. He feels that he is a wiser man after listening to the story and he turned into a good being. Right? And maybe this is the purpose of uh, the ancient mariner because he chose the wedding guest and this wedding guest has to listen to the story. So this is called the ancient mariner for you. Thank you so much.